Good morning, everyone. Thank you for braving the cold today. Coming to the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium here for History is Lunch. I am Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. If you have not already, please silence your cell phones. Don't forget that this week, our two new exhibits open upstairs in the FedEx and Medgar and Murley Evers Exhibition Halls. Spirits of the Passage tells the story of the transatlantic slave trade through artifacts recovered from the wreckage of a slave ship off the coast of Florida. And a companion exhibit, the Slave Series, Quilts by Gwendolyn McGee, is on loan from the Mississippi Museum of Art. Both exhibits open to the public on Saturday, but museum members, and you can all join today and become a museum member if you're not already, are invited to a special free preview of the exhibit, or of the, both exhibits, this Friday during regular museum hours. And I hope that you'll be able to join us back here next week for History's Lunch when our speaker will be Ben Wynn to discuss his new book, The Man Who Punched Jefferson Davis, The Political Life of Henry S. Foote, Southern Unionist. Today, though, we are delighted to welcome Mark LaFrancis, Robert Morgan, and Daryl White to talk about their new book, The Parchment Ordeal, 1965, Natchez, Civil Rights and Justice. Mark LaFrancis of Natchez has been a writer and photographer for more than 30 years. He served for 23 years in the United States Air Force, Air National Guard, and Air Force Reserve. LaFrancis is the founder and president of the Home with Heroes Foundation, a private nonprofit dedicated to helping veterans and their families. Robert Morgan is also a 30-year U.S. Air Force veteran who lives in Natchez. Morgan holds degrees from St. Leo University and Troy State University. He works with New Dawn Video Productions and the Natchez Association for the Preservation of Afro-American History and Culture. Daryl White is Director of Cultural Tourism for Natchez. He narrates the documentary, The Parchment Ordeal, The Untold Story. And of course, many of you will remember Daryl from his History as Lunch a few years ago when he screened the documentary, The 30th of May, about the long-running Memorial Day celebration in Natchez and Vidalia. Daryl's going to come up and introduce the segment of the film, and uh, we'll get underway. Help me welcome Daryl White. Good afternoon. I have to first say how much it pleases me to look up upon all of you to know that within the last 24 hours, the word was that practically all of Mississippi was going to be shut down because of bad weather. <laughs> and the fact that you all are here today is truly a blessing. Again, my name is Darrell White. For many years, I served as the director of the Natchez Museum of African American History and Culture. Today, they changed the title up, and I'm, as he mentioned, the director of cultural heritage tourism for the city of Natchez. So part of that hat says, y'all come on down and give us a visit. But today, I want to share with you um, a labor of love. It seems as if a few years ago, in commemoration and support of the, or acknowledging the signing of the Civil Rights Act, the Natchez Literary and Cinema Celebration dedicated that year's programming to civil rights. One of the events associated with that festival was visits to four churches that were instrumental during the 1960s civil rights era as a meeting place where folks who were standing up for what they believed to be right would have an opportunity to gather and discuss their concerns and from there take to the streets to let their voices be heard. Well, at one of those church programs, as folks customarily do in church, some folks got up to give testimony and their giving of their testimony, some very profound words were uttered. At that time, at the conclusion of that program, I was approached by a dear friend of mine who happened to be a filmmaker. We had worked together on projects before, and he said, Nadaro, I don't know how I can get in touch with these people, but we need to do something with this information that was just presented. And I couldn't agree more. As a museum director, I knew that I could definitely use all of that material 
amongst the archives of the museum. So we're going to see what we can do about that. So Mark and I continued to talk back and forth for a period of time. Then one day we got to start. We would contact the Mississippi Humanities Council and, hey, Stuart, <laughs> and see if we could secure funding to do an oral history project. And that way, we could document the stories which we had heard. So, the Humanities Council said, thumbs up. And we began to gather up these individuals to begin to tell their story. Well, in the process of filming and recording these oral histories, I'll get back to that. After doing the oral histories, the requirement of the grant said that one portion of the material will be submitted to the uh, Center for the Study of Oral History at the University of Southern Mississippi that I could retain copies of all the oral histories at the museum. But then I realized that unless you were a student of that era, or you were a family member had heard that we had some film or something with grandma's or grandpa's story on it, that there would be a limited audience for folks to take in the materials we had, we had created. So we then decided we would uh, take those oral histories and do a documentary. We would take that documentary with a whole lot of, whole lot of forethought. We went before the um, Mississippi Public Broadcasting and formed the idea. They said, sounds like a winner. However, you know you have to keep it within, what was it, 57 and 3 quarters minutes for broadcast. So that means we had all of this material, but now we got to whittle it down to cover the broadcast window for MPB, which they did broadcast the full documentary. But you know, when we had this much material and had to whittle it down, there was still so much more to be told. So then came the book, <laughs> which, you know, pause for a moment for a word from our sponsors. You can get a copy of it over there a little later on. <laughs> in the preparation of all of this project, again, it was indeed a labor of love. We didn't do it for fame. We didn't do it for notoriety. We did it to give a voice to people who had sacrificed greatly and had never been acknowledged for what they had endured. In putting this project together, a lady came into the museum to visit and I said, let me take you around this way first because uh, as we make our way through, I've got this room set up over here to do some, some, some interviews. And once we start filming in this area, you won't have access to it. So let me take you there first. So the lady asked me was it, what we're working on, and I explained the project to her. And she says, oh, give me your phone number. I'm going to give you a number, and I want you to give me a call this evening. I said, OK. What I did not know is that lady was the planner for that year's annual convention of Dr. Martin Luther King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And they were planning that year's convention. And that evening on that telephone call, I spoke to the CEO of SCLC and all the other committee members. And they said, that sounds interesting. Do you think that possibly you can uh, bring some of this down and um, present it at our convention? 
Well, Mark and I were so elated at the fact that somebody was now going to be interested in some work that we were doing. And the other third party of that, of that dynamic, I won't say dynamic duo, but this, um, these three musketeers, Robert Morgan, we got together and we put together a brief introduction to the project. We'll now share with you that introduction to the parchment ordeal, the untold story. Hello. <laughs> Lights, camera, and action. Here we go. There we go. Terrible, terrible. I didn't know, uh, they said there was parchment. I'd never been to prison before. I'd never done anything wrong. I was scared. I wanted my mother. Oh, it was just terrible. All the other people and separating people from each other. I didn't know what was going on. The year? was 1965. President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Landmark Voting Rights Act with Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. looking on. A new day was dawning for African Americans who had waited so long for equal rights. especially for African Americans in Natchez, Mississippi, the oldest continuous settlement on the Mississippi River. Where once the slave trade, not just cotton, was king, tens of thousands of African Americans shackled in chains were sold like cattle at the forks of the road. Generations of slaves thought freedom was near in 1865 as the Civil War came to an end at such a high price. In the next 100 years, progress for African Americans was met with white resistance throughout the Deep South. Segregation, discrimination, and even death was a part of life. In Natchez, Mississippi, the Ku Klux Klan often paraded proudly through downtown. African Americans were told, mind your place. Well, you know, as a young black just say, person back then, you know, they always say stay in your place, our parents, you know, because if we were walking the street or something, and a white woman came along, and if you look hard, you know, you could be discriminated against. Uh, if you whistle, they could say you were whistling at her, and it could bring some kind of harm to you, you know. So we grew up in the fear of white people back then. One time, I was a little girl, I once when I was a little girl, and I was down, I was riding with my big brother in his car. And I had to be maybe about 10, 10 or 9 years old. And I was in his car with him and we stopped uptown. He stopped uptown and he parked. And the, we, wherever he went, where he parked at, they had these three white men standing on the side. And when my brother got out to his car to go take care of his business, because like I said, I was a child, and one of the white men referred to him as a horse, and I'll never forget that. He said, you can't park that horse. So my brother didn't argue with him. 
He got in his car and he drove away and we went parked somewhere else. And that, like I said, I was about nine or 10 years old when that happened. Because I understand that they had looked at us as property. And that's what he, my brother was to him, property, an animal. And I didn't appreciate that. And I, like I said, I had to be like eight or nine, 10 years old. And I felt that. I can remember as a child, being with my mother, we would go into the store uh, with my grandmother and they would get their items and in line. And then this white person would come and get in front of them and get waited on first. And I was in school and I knew that if you're in line, you don't skip. So this must was like seven, five, seven, eight years old. I was aware then that something wasn't right because uh, like I said, they taught us, you don't skip in the lunch line, you don't skip in any line. If somebody's there, you let them go and then you go your turn. So I noticed then that something wasn't right. When NAACP leader George Metcalf was nearly killed in his truck, the African-American community was shocked and angered. To make matters worse, petitions to city leaders for racial equality fell on deaf ears. Frustrated and angry, African Americans took to the streets with boycotts and marches. Marches often gathered at Beulah Baptist Church for inspiration and courage. On one fateful night in October of 1965, the mood was particularly electrifying. Charles Evers, brother of slain civil rights leader Medgar Evers, was at the pulpit. When we were at the Beulah Baptist Church, and it was like, uh, there was like electricity in the air, you know. It was as though, you know, when you come to like a boiling point, you say, we are going to do something today, regardless. You know, and that was, I think, the most significant thing I remember. And that was the day that uh, we decided we were going to march. We had been told by uh, uh, state officials, the city officials, we couldn't march. And we said, we're going to march regardless. And I was excited. And they said, well, you could get arrested. Well, we used to get arrested. And they had the paddy wagons lined up. And uh, we knew that. Something big was going to happen in Natchez that day, you know. Blocks away, more marches packed into China Grove Baptist Church. Indeed, something big did happen when they left the churches. They never did march. Police met them outside the churches, forced them into buses, and drove them to the Natchez City Auditorium. Most were in their teens and early 20s. The city auditorium is a vast hall made for pageants and concerts. Back then, it was off limits to African Americans. At first they would say we were gonna take us to jail, but by this time they started, we started hearing words that the jail was full, the jail was full, they're gonna take us to the city auditorium and lock us up there. So actually it was like a cattle roundup because there were so many of us, and uh, so we started saying, well, we're gonna go to the city auditorium, they're taking us to the city auditorium. So, from what I can remember, it started getting on up in the evening. It was hundreds of people, actually. You know, but back then, it looked like it was hundreds of. Oh, when I walked in the auditorium, it was just people everywhere. Kids, adults, you know, crying, praying, uh, just sobbing, and, and kids looking for their parents, and parents looking for their children. And it was probably at almost full capacity. Authorities had arranged to take some marches to local jails, while others had a worse fate. A four-hour bus ride to the Mississippi State Penitentiary in Parchment. Bus ride was, it was terrifying. It was really terrifying because it was black dark at that time of the year. And we, it was a long, long ride. 
and you know, we just no. I don't. I don't even know if anybody on the bus knew what Parkland was at the time. You know, we'd never heard of it. So we just rode and rode, and and it was just fearful because we had seen movies where people were being taken off and hanged and killed and left, and we didn't know if they were just taking a bus load of us to kill us. So, I mean, it was just all. It was just the fear of the unknown. It was just so terrifying because everywhere you look, it was just dark, dark, dark. When the bus stopped, I remember um, we had guards. I know it was like two police officers, and I want to say one was a fireman you know, in the front of the bus, just like you see on TV now. And when the bus stopped, one of them said, he had his back turned, I don't know which one it was, but I remember him saying, we're here now, get your black asses off. For days, the young men and women were subjected to humiliation and punishment. Now, 50 years later, we're dedicated to telling their story. And so they lined up single file line. They had our backs toward a fence, which we were told it was an electrical fence. So do not touch it, okay? Then in the front of us, they had their dogs. They were standing there with the dogs on, on the leash, you know? So we got dogs barking and growling, slobbing at the mouth at us on an electrical fence, and we're in between the two of them, you know? And then they thought it was funny to, you know, the, push the dog towards you and get that close and snatch them back. I mean, they just, they just played with our fear. It was really just horrible. That's just a few moments of what was eventually de fully developed in telling the story of those who've been unjustly um, imprisoned for what? For following through their First Amendment rights, the right to assemble, the right to take your grievances to the, to the powers that be. Keeping in mind, this occurred in 1965. The voting, I'm sorry, the Civil Rights Act was signed in 1964 that said that they had a right to do certain things. And now they want to take it to the streets. Over 700 people were at one point arrested. I'm not sure if you were fully able to grasp it from the small piece that, that you saw here. They were arrested for parading without a permit. But didn't they have a right to get together and say we have a problem and we need to work on it? But they never violated the ordinance for which they had been arrested because they didn't march on the street that day. They walked out of the church and got on buses that carried them to the city auditorium where they were then told they were under arrest. They never went before a judge. They never saw a magistrate. They were never charged with having committed a crime. Yet we're still trying to get exact numbers as to how many people ended up at the penitentiary. Because for some reason or another, the State Department of Correction kind of scratches their head in bewilderment every time we ask any questions about detail about that period. I will say we had gone so far as to make arrangements to actually go to the penitentiary and do some filming there. But we discovered that they were held in what was then designated as Unit 17. 
Unit 17 was the uh, maximum security death row. You see, the superintendent there at the, super at the penitentiary decided that they would separate them from the general population. So he emptied out the whole maximum security wing and put them there. Our research also explore, exposed to us that Unit 17 was the same spot where the Freedom Riders were held in 1961. So what the Freedom Riders had endured then, that was just practice for what they did to those youngsters coming from Natchez in 1965. It's not covered in this, in this particular piece, but I'll tell you, they were abused. Stripped of, women were allowed to cleep most of their clothing. The men were all stripped naked. In a cell that was designed to house two inmates with a metal bunk bed, sink and a commode, Anywhere from six, seven, eight people were put in each of those cells. Each of those folks were forced to consume laxatives. For whatever reason, I can't, I still to this day can't understand. And the women's cells we learned were given a complete roll of toilet paper. The men were given just a few squares. It didn't take too long before they started having plumbing problems in those cells. So now you can come through with the hoses to wash these animals down. And this was occurring in October. And I'm sure it wasn't quite as bad as it was the last couple of nights here in Jackson, but the temperature had dropped considerably particularly on your wet body in those jail cells. After 72 hours being held, they were told that if someone pays your bond back in Natchez, they can come and get you. As no arrangements had been made to return them back home. So members of the NAACP and the churches and the family members put together caravans and things to go to the penitentiary and try to bring people home. It was truly a traumatic experience for many of those individuals who had endured that parchment ordeal. They were never recognized. It was just something that happened. And most folks had just wished that it would go away. Our working this project came at the end of a 50-year period. So not only did we afford the people the opportunity to release some of that pent-up anger and emotion, and it was truly, a personally, a, a journey for me to sit across from these folks and fire off a couple of questions and encourage them to open up. And that's the examples of what some of those folks had to say in this video piece that you just had a little preview of. <clears throat> but we were able to acknowledge what had happened. If you get a chance, and they are available right here to the side, commercial break, to see the full documentary, you will learn that for the 50th anniversary of the incident, we were able to assemble as many of those who had been to the penitentiary that we could find and that would come forward. They, there was a, uh, a banquet testimonial banquet that was issued and given to all of them. We were a even able to secure 
a formal apology given by the mayor of the city of Natchez at that time that stated pretty much that the local government failed its citizens and what had happened to those people so many years ago. Keeping in mind, many were in their late teens and early 20s and now had to carry the burden of what they had experienced throughout their entire lifetime. But we was able to do some ni something nice for them. Again, it was a banquet. They were all recognized. They even got t-shirts that said, I survived parchment. <laughs> Well, again, after the DVD came the book. The book allowed us to expand upon the stories that had been told and give much more of an overview of the times and what was going on here in the state of Mississippi in 1965. I will tell you, I'll share with you that the film had been entered in a number of um, film festivals. The Crossroads Festival here in the state of Mississippi awarded the film the most transformative film of that year's festival. And we, to this very day, are so pleased and proud of having had the opportunity to interact with those folks, to document their stories and their history. And we're working now on our next major project, the women of the struggle. The mothers, the wives, the daughters, the women who were behind the men who were seen to have been the leadership within the state throughout the civil rights era. I'm going to um, call some of my cohorts to come and join us to give their take or feeling towards, and at the end, I guess we'll entertain some questions and all, but I want to give them each an opportunity to flip the little switch and come and join us. Mark LaFrancis and Robert Morgan. Hope you can hear me, yes? First off, I want to thank you for being here. And it is very, very moving to be in this building with the Civil Rights Museum next door. I also want to thank the Mississippi Humanities Council. Dr. Stuart Rockoff is here. And our wonderful advisor, Dr. Robbie Luckett, who was with us through thick and thin. Is there anyone here from Mississippi Public Broadcasting? No, we, I need to do a shout out to them. This never would have been made if it hadn't been for happenstance. When Robert Morgan, Darrell White, and I were at that Beulah Baptist Church, Little Baptist Church. By the way, Robert's a deacon in that very same church. Listening to these stories and hear rose on my arm as a storyteller and a filmmaker and a journalist and I think a godly caring person. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. That these people were telling stories that happened 50 years earlier about the horror they went through and that nothing had been done. Not a word in the newspaper, not a story in any magazine, not even an apology. And they had bottled it all in 
or half century. I couldn't imagine the agony that these people went through year after year after year, and some going to their death thinking nobody cared. But we did. We cared so deeply that we decided their story had to be told the way they lived it. Not the way we wanted to tell it, but the way they lived it. And I'm really proud to say that as a filmmaker, one of the greatest honors in a documentary like this is to have the subjects come up and thank you profusely for telling their story at, with respect. It's a wonderful experience. I hope you do experience the full film. It is bracing. It is moving. It is disturbing at times. But it should be. It should be. For what they went through, it should be. If you experience the film and the book, little commercial plug, Please go on Amazon and give us some stars. Other people purchase based on <laughs> stars, correct? And a little review, we would appreciate that. If you're on Facebook, the Parchment Ordeal Facebook page, please like it, and then you'll learn about our upcoming project, The Women of the Struggle Facing Fear in the Civil Rights Era, another powerful film that will tell stories the way they want them told. Thank you, and I'll let Robert say a few words. Good afternoon, everyone. You know, uh, first and foremost, thank you so very much for being here because I know you could have been somewhere else, but you've taken the time to be with us in having us share a little portion of history. Now, Mark said it. We did not want to do it in what we thought was the best way to do it. We wanted to honor those who were a part of that struggle and do their story that is most appealing and that did them the best that they knew and was, was able to offer how they went through the struggle. And that's going into it, our entire goal right there. We did not want to do a film just for the sake of doing a film. As a matter of fact, on that particular weekend when it occurred, being in the church, and hearing this story and having so many individuals say, I did not realize, I didn't even know this happened. And I lived in Natchez my entire life. Not me, but hearing the individuals that said that. And at that point, we just knew that it's something that we had to do something about. Now, Daryl and Mark, they are the voice and they offer the technical expertise I am the one, I appreciate just being as far back as I can and do whatever was needed to go ahead on and make this story a story that those individuals can appreciate. I just want to say uh, a shout out to uh, Chris and the Civil Rights Museum for offering us the opportunity to be here because without you, without uh, being here, we can't get this story out. And that's our whole entire goal is to just go ahead on and tell the story, let it be seen, let it be known of what transpired. And I thank you very much. And I want to emphasize that the, I should have, I'm sorry. I want to emphasize that the story doesn't stop here. In our interviews, the survivors had a really strong message, teach voting rights and civil rights. Let our experience not just end. 
We suffered. Let's make that suffering count. So we have created a nonprofit foundation, the Parchment Ordeal Foundation, excuse me, <clears throat> and part of the proceeds will go to bringing the stories and the message to schools and universities and community groups and anybody who will listen, but mostly to young people who in high school are pretty much the same age as those who went to Parchment. So we are dedicated to doing that. So the story doesn't end and the struggle doesn't end. Little things like Ms. Brown shared upon her return to Natchez after having been at the penitentiary. She very clearly said two things that jumped back at me during our, our interview. The first thing she said was, I got home. I ain't go out the house for two weeks. See, I thought I was going to get arrested. And I had to wash and bathe and wash and bathe to get that parchment <clears throat> off my skin. And then she made a very profound comment and statement. She said when she got arrested and sent to the penitentiary for standing up for voting rights, she wasn't even old enough to vote. And she said, but now folks can. And what's the problem? Why are they not doing it? She said, you don't have to tell me who you're voting for. Just go to the polls and vote. It just so happened that when the movie was premiered on Mississippi Public Broadcasting, it was aired like a week before the election cycle. So it's important that even those among, amongst you today realize the significance and the importance of exercising those rights and making sure that your voice is heard. Because if you don't, you have to go along with the will of the majority of whoever showed up and live with the decisions that were made by others when you had a right to go and cast a, a ballot so that your voice could be heard and to, for you to encourage others to do so because the sacrifices made by that roughly 150 folks we put our, be able to put our fingers on that actually went to the penitentiary, again, had not, had not violated. They were arrested for violation of an ordinance which was later found to be unconstitutional. And they were never charged and they never went before a judge or a magistrate. And without, the, without due process, was sent to the penitentiary, where they were subsequently abused. And for what? Just because they wanted to stand up and voice that they, a, a displeasure as to some things that were going on. So don't be silent, be loud, <laughs> because others before have sacrificed to enable you to be able to do so. Any questions, qualms, or criticism? The microphone is going to go around. Oh, uh, before we go into questions, let me, sh let me share with you also uh, to let you know that just to uh, show how the story doesn't end, uh, our mayor, the Honorable uh, Darrell Grinnell, had uh, put together a commission. And what he uh, is planning and doing right now is the very site where these individuals was arrested at the auditorium, he have an initiative to uh, put a monument up to go ahead on and honor those individuals 
right on that site at the uh, city auditorium where they were arrested and kept, a lot of them before coming to Parchment. That monument, he's uh, established a GoFundMe page and so forth to go ahead on and raise the fund to be able to do it. So from one initiative, the story doesn't end and it keeps going. I want to commend you for your effort. I think it's an excellent project. Um, but a question that comes to my mind is um, why is, no, is there no legal action against the authorities for violating the rights, the civil rights of the marches? Couldn't they, shouldn't there be some legal action to yeah, correspond to this kind of violation of their civil rights. And secondly, um, the, um, I mean, now it's 55 years, 54 years after, and some people's memories have been tarnished. Why have you waited so late? Oh, why now? Why not before? Because if you're going to be getting the true story of these people, then you want the stories when it is fresh in their minds. And now seems so late. Some people have been, been died. But I, certainly the effort is very commendable. Thank you. In response to that question, yes, there were a number of um, lawsuits at some point filed. It went all the way up to the Fifth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals who pretty much ruled that the city of Natchez had not really done anything wrong. Because if there was a law on the books that said that they weren't supposed to hit the streets, then um, it was the, the sheriff's and the police chief's obligation to enforce the law. It was only later on that they determined that that particular law was unconstitutional. Um, and the, the weight of it was given to the, put on upon the shoulders of the superintendent of the penitentiary who received them, abused them, and then released them. Basically what they were doing was trying to teach them a lesson. And hope, hopefully they thought that that was gonna put an end to the movement that was building momentum there in Natchez. But at the conclusion, that was in October of 1965. Before the end of that year, an economic boycott had been, had been initiated, which pretty much brought the finances of the community to its knees. It was going now into the holiday season and the merchant community said, please do something to stop this boycott because we got to get these dollars flowing for the holiday season coming in. The Natchez movement was one of the few to few community-based civil rights era of, um, projects to make demands and ultimately have many of their demands met without federal intervention and without the support of the mainstream civil rights movement. You see, the mainstream movement advocated peaceful, nonviolent resistance. But the old Natchez district was subject to some of the most violent factions of the Ku Klux Klan we found anywhere throughout the South. We had Klansmen down there in that area that even the Ku Klux Klan was afraid of. Okay. Um, Pulitzer Surprise nominee, nominated author Stanley Nelson did a book, Devil's Walking, which speaks to Klan activities in that region. And it lays out, again, these were the Klansmen that the Ku Klux Klan was afraid of. 
But the folks in Natchez stood up to that as well. And there was a group that was organized to call themselves the Deacons for Defense and Justice. Whereas the mainstream movement advocated peaceful, nonviolent resistance, in Natchez they practiced armed resistance. And they got guns and put the Klan on notice. And I can honestly tell you, in all of my research, I have yet to uncover anything to indicate that there was ever the shootout at the OK Corral. <laughs> it didn't happen. But the movement in Natchez was so profound that Sam Bowers, the grand poobah <laughs> of the Ku Klux Klan in Mississippi, <laughs> issued a 90-day moratorium on Klan activities so they can figure out what to do about them niggas in Natchez with the guns. And the fact that there would be immediate armed retaliation for Klan activity made the Klan itself back up. When the Night Riders came throughout the community, the deacons would get in their trucks and go out looking for them. Again, I say, in my research, I have yet to come across anything to indicate that there was ever a shootout. But the thought that them folks were armed and were going to stand up to it made some folks back up. Uh, the second part of your question as far as uh, why now, uh, those individuals, especially the one that went to Parchment, they didn't even talk about it. They did not talk about it. As a matter of fact, even their own family members didn't know what they actually went through. A lot of the stories uh, that came out, they started learning about it once they uh, started the interviews and showing what they actually went through. So. Uh, would, uh, I'm quite certain there was a number of individuals who would have loved to do it a lot earlier, but those individuals who were actual survivors, they didn't even talk about it at all. So I hope that satisfied the second part of your question. How long was the group at Parchman, and who were the people who worked to get them released? After the 72 hours, they were told that if somebody can come, if someone posted your bond, they can come and get you. It's only been within the last two or three weeks that we was able to uncover something that specifically identified somebody in the legal system down there that has set some arbitrary figure that had to be paid in order for them to become released. But, you know, the question now is, you know, who authorized it and where did that money go? <laughs> okay. Um, Anything else? Uh, there was there uh, uh, upwards of like uh, uh, two days to six days. Two, yeah, two to six days before the last folks left the penitentiary. But there were terrifying two to six days. They were not in the hospitality suite by any means. <laughs> was this the first attempt for a group to organize to protest for the rights? And if so, if, or if not, what other information do you have to groups prior to uh, gathering or organizing to, for protests? It grew out what was happening in Natchez seemingly, particularly with the deacons, was then replicated, duplicated in other locations throughout the state. And that was one of the most significant I'm going to say factors to bringing change within the state of Mississippi because people stood up and did not, did not sit quietly and they fought. This is, a, this is occurring in 1965. You got to remember, right after that, you hear um, Fannie Lou Hamer coming out of the Delta. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Now we got to do something about this. All these things are falling into place now. Excuse me? Specifically to the Natchez area, I guess I'm trying to <coughs> this group was the first group to organize, to protest. To this, to this level and be successful. To be successful in their efforts. But there were many marches. Yeah, there, there were things going on all over. But they were able to make something happen. 
Sir? Who was the mayor then? Nasser. Yes. Mayor Nasser. Nasser was a, of Lebanese descent. And I understand that it was very convenient that on the, when, the, when the order was issued to arrest them, Nasser was out of town somewhere. So he was not there to, to, to actually oversee what had happened. You mentioned that you have a Facebook page. Do you have a website? Parchment Ordeal. Dot org. Dot org. Parchment Ordeal dot org. Other questions? Again, seeing no other, <laughs> we <laughs> thank each and every one of you for your presence here and the folks with the Department of Archives and History for allowing us to come before you to share with you some, some, a little something about a specific period and workings in our lives as we just step forward to try to help somebody else have their stories be, be acknowledged and told. Again, we thank you. Again, we encourage you to come and visit the folks that's going to be over here. To <laughs> come on now. <laughs> and understand, we didn't do this to make money. I'm not encouraging you to get a book or a DVD to make money. I'm encouraging you to get the book or the DVD so that you will have accurate information as you share what you have learned today with others. Because I don't want you, I want you to talk about it, but I don't want you to go somewhere and tell somebody something that ain't true. Because that doesn't help the situation. We want the truth to be told as much as possible in every venue you know, the old gospel, go tell it from the mountaintop. Yeah, tell the truth. And we want to make sure you have the, you have the accurate information. So see the folks over the table. Accurate information available on the table over here. <laughs> thank you all for coming today. I hope that you'll be able to join us next Wednesday. Help me thank Morgan, Gerald, and Mark for this program today.